I mean, it would be nice for us to go to our graves knowing that this has been solved. I, <laughs> I just can't believe that 44 years later, we still don't know anything. It's been more than four decades since two teenagers went to a drive-in movie and never made it back home. My first thought, when mom said she didn't come home, Ricky didn't come home, that we were never gonna see her again. I didn't think it was a runaway. I felt it was more drastic than that. I was hoping it yeah. was anything but that. It was a hot and sticky August night in Akron, Ohio, when 19-year-old Ricky Beard arrived to pick up his 17-year-old girlfriend, Mary Leonard. They had been dating for a while, and they went to a drive-in movie, and they actually left the movie early, and then ended up back on uh, her front porch. And that is where the mystery starts. So where did the teen couple go? I, I get, it's just more shocking there's no there's no witnesses, there's no nothing, there's really, uh, there's nothing to it. A gruesome discovery six years later shattered any hopes the kid's family still had that Mary and Ricky could still be alive. And then they come to find out, they found the bodies right where, where we was, you know, right where we was uh, searching. Right across. Let's go right across the street. Yeah. Detectives tried everything to solve the murders, even enlisting the help of psychics to try and catch the killer. You know, we're kind of skeptical of, but uh, I said, look, would it, let's give it a shot. Whatever you want to do, let's give it a shot. That's how open we are to, yeah. normally we wouldn't really explore that. In this episode, I'm cracking back open the cold case file 44 years later and sitting down with some of the detectives who worked the case. I'm also talking with the teens' families who are still desperate for justice all these years later. I'm Kelly Kennedy, and you're listening to Dark Side of the Land. Time does not heal all wounds. Take it from the families of Mary and Ricky, who say the tragedy that took their siblings away in 1979 affected every aspect of their lives. 44 years, I know, sounds like a really long time to maybe a casual observer, but it's been our lives for 44 years, and I mean, you know, I've explained it to my children. Now I'm probably going to have to explain it to my grandchildren because it's going to be on TV. I sat down in our podcast studio with Mary's oldest brother, Richard Leonard, her middle brother, John Leonard, and her two sisters, Kathy Lynn and Nancy Flack. Ricky's oldest sister, Luann Eddy, also came in to talk with me. Eddy says the mystery has haunted them ever since. I think every decision we've made in our lives has been affected. It's when like I, you're raising your own kids. Yeah, you when know, I'm raising my, when kids, my kids you know. are going out at night when they were teenagers, right, right. Yeah. I was right. relentless on them. You used to say to them, I, I, was, I lost a sister, I don't want to lose a daughter. 17-year-old Mary Leonard was in her senior year at Akron's North High School. Mary's sister, Kathy Lynn, wishes she had spent more time with her youngest sister. She was a good girl. I'm not going to say I know everything about her because you know, she was a teenager, but she was a good girl. Mary was pretty. She had an infectious laugh, lots of friends, and her sister Nancy says she loved her family more than anything. Well, Mary always had a smile on her face. She babysat a lot for us, older ones. She was very well liked, active in, in volleyball, never complained about anything. The siblings tell me their mother, Gloria Leonard, spent her life worried sick about Mary, only to find out years later that it all stemmed from a meeting their mother had with a psychic at a carnival before any of them were even born. When the psychic looked into her crystal ball, she promised Gloria she would have lots of kids. But she also gave her some ominous news. But she said, one of those will not see, will not live to adulthood. And Mary was born on April the 3rd, Friday, that. April the 13th. And she always felt that, that was gonna, she was going to be the one that would not mm -hmm. see adulthood. She always thought she was between the ages. She said if she just gets past, makes it between the ages of 17 and 21. She said, I think she'll be, she'll be all right. And she was 17 when it happened. And I think that's why her and Mary had such a close bond together, because that's just 
it her, on her mind. stayed on her mind all those years. And she seemed to always look after her a lot more. 19-year-old Ricky Beard had recently graduated also from North High School. He was working full-time and planned to go to HVAC school. Those who knew Ricky say he had a great sense of humor, that he was motivated, hardworking, and he was crazy about Mary. He was a hard worker. He really, he, of all my brothers, he probably worked the hardest. He always had a job. The young couple's whirlwind romance started at the beginning of their final summer. I think they started dating right after school let out that summer. And it wasn't too long into their relationship that Mary and Ricky mysteriously vanished. August 24th, 1979. It was a Friday night. Think back to when you were a teenager. Maybe you can remember what it's like to get ready for a Friday night date. The rush of adrenaline and excitement, and this couple was no different. Ricky's sister Luann said her little brother would always run down to North Akron Savings on Friday to cash his paycheck. It was the same bank where their mother happened to work. He gave her enough money to pay his car insurance. He didn't have a whole lot left. I think enough to take Mary to the movies, maybe. It all started at a drive-in movie theater that no longer exists. The Ascot Drive-In used to be on Akron Cleveland Road, which is now State Road in Cuyahoga Falls. And it was a group of kids. There were, yeah, I don't know how many cars. They were in separate cars, but they were all groups of friends were at the drive-in. Police reports show several interviews with the friends who went with Mary and Ricky to see Amityville Horror that night. They told detectives that Ricky kept saying all night long that he had to make sure to have Mary home in time. With Mary's midnight curfew growing closer and Ricky determined to get his girlfriend home on time, the couple left the second showing 10 minutes in and headed home. One of their friends told police he watched Ricky leave the parking lot and turn onto Thayer Avenue to take Mary home. That was the last time he saw them. Akron detective Jim Pasilich was not on the force yet when the teens were killed. But he spent his career investigating the tragedy. The mystery starts after they get back from that drive-in. There's a neighbor that says that he hears them outside um, I think they even put them on the front stoops out there, where there's a sidewalk or the steps up to the house. The Leonard's next door neighbor told police he saw a white Chevrolet parked across the street sometime after 11. He recognized the car as Mary's boyfriend's right away. The son of another neighbor told detectives he left his mother's house around midnight and says he saw both Mary and Ricky sitting on the front sidewalk steps. He says he honked the horn and waved at them and they waved back. <laughs> He even remembers them laughing as he drove by. Mary's brother John says that neighbor swore he saw them. She had a unique laugh and he remembers hearing her laugh. Detective Pasilich and Akron Police Lieutenant David Whitten were still kids themselves when the teens were murdered. But they've been working on cracking this case for years. Obviously this was a brutal case. Two high school sweethearts murdered after going out on a date at a drive-in movie theater. I mean, this must have caught a lot of attention, you know, a lot of eyes. Yeah, at the time it did. Um, first when they went missing, and then when the bodies were actually found, there was uh, a lot of investigative hours put into the original case. Um, it was, you know, it's still one of the, uh, you know, top most talked about uh, cold cases that we have in the city that, that, that we have. Um, it certainly, it, it, the uh, case file itself takes up more room than any other case, and, um, uh, you know, everybody wants to talk about this case and, and figure out what happened, and there were a lot of attempts to do that. The first person to realize the teens were missing was Ricky's dad, Bill Beard. He noticed that Ricky's car wasn't there at around four o'clock in the morning. My dad would get up all yeah, times really of the night early. when we were all teenagers and driving, and he'd look mm -hmm. and see if everybody's car's out there, you know. Yeah. So Rick's wasn't there, so he went driving around and went by every everybody's house that he thought could Rick could be at. He didn't see the car anywhere. Because I think he had done that before. Like, say, oh, his car is at so-and-so's house. He'll be home later. I'm just going back home. When Luann heard that her little brother didn't come home, she wasn't too worried. At least, not at first. I actually was at work, and I worked, this is, I 
bazillion years ago. I worked at Fazio's, and it, which was a grocery store around here. Um, and my grandpa came into the store and told me. Oh. Um, but I wasn't that worried at the moment because Rick, although it, I don't think my grandpa knew he had been on a date. I think he just said Rick. And I didn't realize the, the whole circumstance. But Rick, had, Rick kind of had narcolepsy. So if he was at somebody's house and he was tired, he just went to sleep and then he wouldn't wake up to go home. So, but anyway, when my grandpa told me, I'm like, Oh, I'm sure there's some crazy story. They'll be back. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, and then by the end of that day, it was a lot different. You know, the, the mood had changed. Then Ricky's dad called Mary's parents, who assumed their daughter was fast asleep in bed. It was a horrible, horrible Saturday to wake up to the phone call. <laughs> we told that Mary didn't come home last night, and we don't know where she's at. The mom would, she would always stay up to make sure she got home. And for some reason, she fell asleep on the couch. Yeah. So she didn't hear anything that was going on else. Well, she Post did say she heard oh, yeah, she did commotion hear. out front, but she says, if I had just gotten out up and looked out the right window. Oh. Yeah, she looked out she the looked, side. She looked out the side instead of the front. Uh -huh. She said, if I had just looked out the front window. When I got the call that morning from mom, wanting to know if Mary was at our house. And I said no, and I asked her why, and she says, well, we got a call from Ricky's dad, because he didn't show up at home, and they were looking for him. And, and it was the day my husband's sister was getting married, and it was the hardest thing to have to go to that wedding. Oh my gosh. And couldn't say nothing to anybody, because I didn't want to ruin, ruin my sister-in-law's day. So we made it, and I only went because my daughter was in the wedding as a flower girl. And I um, told, I didn't tell my kids. I just told my husband, I says, don't say nothing to any, any in your family until we get through this. Uh, and I got as far as the dinner. And then I told him, I said, I can't stay. I have to go home. Yeah. And Mary was supposed to go to that wedding too, right? Yeah. She was looking, Excited really looking it. forward yeah. to going to it. At first, police believed the teens may have run away together. I said, no way. I said, didn't do anything to prepare to run away. She, she had taken just enough money out of her account to pay for, uh, buy some film for her camera. I said, everything she was doing was planning yeah. to go yeah. to this wedding the next day. You go, tell me she ran away <laughs> all of a sudden. That's, that's the angle they went, and that's the, they wasted so much time going that way. Looking at it from that angle. The other angle was that she was probably pregnant. Yeah. And I says, no. I says, if she was pregnant. She would have came to one of us. I mean, she was close with our mom. And, yeah. I, still, I, and I had had this conversation one day with her not too long before that. Um, that if she was ever into that situation and she didn't feel she could go to mom, she knew she could come to one of us. We were that close that I, we knew she wouldn't. She wouldn't run away. Well, we were two Catholic families yeah. from North Hill in Akron. Mm -hmm. So a teen pregnancy would have been mm -hmm. a big deal then. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, to hear my, and my parents were like, I hope that's all it is. I hope oh, it's just yeah, the best we yes. We'll yeah, help yeah. them. We'll do whatever we need to do. Yes. You know, they just need to come home. Yeah. But sadly, that is not what it was. Ricky's white Chevrolet was found at a garage in the Northampton area in a farmer's field on Portage Trail. Northampton actually doesn't exist anymore. In the mid-80s, the township merged with Cuyahoga Falls. While Mary and Ricky were nowhere to be found, detectives did find a bullet hole in the windshield. What went through your head when the car was found and you know there was a bullet hole and everything? Very upsetting, you know, and we did see the, the way the area was, and there's no way she's walked out of here. Northampton Township Police searched the cornfield next to the garage and the wooded area to the right. The owner of the farmland where the car was found told detectives that around 2 o'clock in the morning, he heard a noise that he thought was car doors slamming. He said it sounded like more than one door. 
And do you think the bullet hole in the car was connected to their murders? It appears that way. I think there's some people now that try to say that there was, that bullet hole might have been there days before, but at the time when they did the investigation, nobody said that. They said it was after the, uh, the bodies were, or after the car was found, after they ended up missing. Both the Leonard and Beard families believe this is where police dropped the ball back in the 70s. Mary's brother John believes that Ricky's car wasn't properly processed for evidence. Do you feel like if they had handled it differently, this case could be solved by now? Who knows what they would have found on that car if they hadn't let everybody and everybody's brother go up to it and touch it and, you know, who knows what yeah, they would have found. How can they say there's no fingerprints on it? Because that they, they, never, yeah. they didn't I mean, take it to the police station. <laughs> yeah, and they should yeah. have never released his car when they did, mm -hmm. until they got more information. I mean, when I heard that they let your father drive the car away, I went, what? Yeah. And literally, my dad waited down the we had a neighbor, one of our neighbors brought the extra keys down. There were no yeah. keys. Yeah. Had to bring my dad keys. Um, and I, mean, I think my brother was down there too. I mean, granted, at the time it was only supposedly a couple of missing kids, but you know, they're missing kids and you got a bolt hole in the window. I mean, maybe you better look into this a little deeper. But they just brush it off. Oh, they'll be home. And there was another thing that didn't really make much sense. Whoever murdered the teens didn't make much of an effort to hide Ricky's car. So how did they even find the car in there? Well, well, that's for some weird. reason. What? It was pulled in, but it wasn't pulled in far enough that you couldn't see it from the road. The tail end oh. was still sticking out, and they could have, they drove right over the garage door that had been collapsed. And they could have gone even further in if they were really trying to hide the car. But they stopped with the tail end still sticking out. The family believes that someone tampered with the evidence inside the car. Somebody got to it between the time it was first found and the police went back there later on. Right. Because there was tall grass on the part that was still outside the garage and the grass that was on the outside of the door was now tucked inside the door. So somebody had opened the door because they reported seeing something, it's just, I don't remember what it was, something on the, on the floorboard. And they, when they came back, it was gone. It was gone. And the door had been opened and closed. They didn't, like, tape off the crime scene? No. no. They let her dead, I mean, let his dad the drive Matthews. the car back to the house. And as the search for the missing teens continued, over the years, Mary's family said they were given false hope more than once. We had several people, different people call. A guy from Mansfield that was in Mansfield. Reformatory. That's what I was, trying to think I was at my parents. Ron and I were at the house there one day when yeah, the mailman was there came. When came. And there was a letter from a, a prisoner from Mansfield saying that mm -hmm. uh, for exchange for Mary and Ricky, meet us uh, up with the detective that put him in jail at North High School, mm -hmm. such such a day at a certain time. Yeah. My dad in, insisted on being there, and the police told us that it was a hoax, but. You know, they told us why he was doing this, that he has no involvement in what's going yeah, on, what happened. He named the two detectives he wanted yeah. involvement because they're the ones that put him away. But my dad, and the, but we'll follow through with it, and dad insisted on being there. They had a yeah. bulletproof vest on him, and of course, you know, we're listening to this all in the police van, that nothing was ever found. Another incident, we got a saying to go to Gorge uh, Park, and they would release Mary to us there. I remember that they one. They told us that was nothing going to, but of course, you have to follow through with it because you just don't know. So we're all sitting in our in the parking lot, and these kids with the teenagers' cars come barreling through, laughing at us, honking their horn, and all this stuff. It's so cool. Yeah, and then one day, mom went to get the newspaper, and there was a a jar full of money and a note from the paper boy. And that was at the time we had fundraiser to pay for this detective, mm -hmm. and he says. I was saving this to buy me a new bike, but you guys need it more than I do. Oh, God, I didn't know that. That's so sweet. So it was like people like that that were so cruel and people that weren't. Luann says her father was so desperate to find Ricky that he kept a daily log of everything that happened. She still has it. He has horrible handwriting, so I can't read all of it, but my dad logged everything. Um, my dad wrote to um, the FBI. He wrote to the National Guard. He wrote to the Selective Service, because at the time, um, 
boys that age were supposed to register for the draft, and Rick had not done that. So my dad said, well, I'll just turn them in for not registering for the draft. Maybe somebody will look for We wanted He wanted them to look for them for yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. whatever reasons. For six years, police searched the area. The Beards and the Leonard searched. Their friends searched. Volunteers searched. But they couldn't find any sign of the missing teens. Mary's oldest brother, Richard Leonard, felt like he had to stay strong for his family. But that wasn't always easy. All I know is when I, I was, when they started having the search parties going, I was, I was glad I was able to participate in it, you know. And then they come to find out, they found the bodies right where, where we was, you know, right where we was uh, searching. Right across. Go yeah. right across the street. Yeah. Yeah. After six years of agony, everyone's worst nightmares were confirmed. On May 29, 1985, a utility crew working in North Akron made a horrifying discovery. Skeletal remains. My understanding is well, there were they were trenching for utilities. And they were hitting an area where there was too much water, too much high water content, so they were diverting over, and it was on that diverting tracks. over is where they came across the remains. Had they been continuing to dig with the way they were, they might not have ever saw them. They also found pieces of a yellow shirt that sadly matched the shirt that Mary was last seen wearing. I understood that when the guy came up after he dug in there that he saw Clothing and bones. Right, that's what I said. Before he put the dirt back. Right, as when they was said. when they were getting ready to put the dirt back is when they spotted okay. him. Because yeah, he mentioned said she had a yellow Acme T-shirt on, uh, sweatshirt I guess you could say, and that just you know, the first thing he spotted was that. The yellow shirt. Yeah. He told her stop digging, one. and they started mm-hmm. searching. But it was to me it was almost like divine guidance because if they hadn't hit the water and changed directions slightly, they may have never come across them. According to the autopsy report, Mary was stabbed in the heart and shot three times. One of the shots shattered her sixth right rib. She was also shot at least twice in her left arm. And since her left elbow was shattered, the medical examiner believed she may have been shot there as well. Mary also had some chipped teeth. The ME believed that was likely from several punches to the jaw. Ricky was shot three times, in the shoulder, neck, and back. The ME said in his report that the wounds were classic signs of, quote, overkill. So Kathy, Rich, and I went down, and they were sifting through it. They had Mary's right scapular sitting there, and they showed it to us. Um, They determined that she was stabbed um, and shot from when when the remains were sent to Smithsonian. They found chips or pieces of the bone missing. Um, And they, their theory was that whatever they were trying to go after Ricky for, they used her as to torture. They felt she was tortured, hoping whatever he was supposed to be involved in, that he would open up. There was one Akron police officer, Officer Bob Swain, who went above and beyond to try and crack the case. But sadly, he died in 2014 without ever getting to do that. It really affected him because he was had a daughter that was around that age, and he said he would work on it till the day he died. Swain did. Yes, yeah. he did. Detective Pasilich and Lieutenant Whitten both said that Officer Swain really left no stone unturned when it came to this case. I mean, he did a lot of work reviewing this case, and uh, he really had a personal attachment to it because he was one of the original officers that was assigned to, um, once the remains were found, they had to wait for some specialists to come in. So Bob was in patrol at the time and he was assigned to watch the remains overnight and he really got attached to this case. And it was Officer Swain's idea to bring in psychics on the case. What did they say, anything at all? Just a couple, one of them said something about a car, about a specific colored car, but that's pretty much it. It really, it really wasn't anything that you couldn't you couldn't get from reading the case. It wasn't anything shocking. It wasn't anything new or anything. We said, oh my gosh, we got to follow up on this. The family tells me they realized later on that some of what the psychic said did turn out to be true. Like clues about the teens being found near a blue utility box and something orange colored. One psychic 
S mm -hmm. told us to go to um, around Zaley's farm to look for something orange or rust color, uh, a blue box, and where they were found. And I didn't realize it till my brother Tom called and said, do you remember what was down there? And what the psychic told us to look for, well, there was a blue box that had something to do with the railroad. Some kind of utility box. Yeah. Oh. And there was a, an abandoned rust-colored, orange-colored couch. Akron police had dozens of possible suspect files, but let's go through a few of the most investigated theories. First up, that Mary and Ricky were targeted by a biker gang like the Hells Angels or the Brothers. The medical examiner believed that the brutalness of their injuries was consistent with the M.O. of some biker gangs at the time. At some point, he makes some direction towards that um, because of the injuries. Okay. Um, but there's no evidence other than, there's no physical evidence to say, hey, you know, it's because of drug use or drug selling or um, gang activity or stealing something or anything. There's nothing that links anywhere that way. There was, you know, there was also, too, some speculation that uh, Ricky might have been involved in drugs and dealing drugs. Was there any actual evidence to link Ricky to drug dealing? Well, they, I mean, there was, I believe there was like a marijuana type, part of a marijuana cigarette found in the car. But how big of a dealer could a 17-year-old be back in the day, which it could be a lot, but, you know, right. to, to, to get killed over it like this, it's, um, there's just nothing, there's not a whole lot of evidence that we have right now that would support that. The family doesn't think that's it either. Yeah, they did say because of the way their injuries were, but they had no involvement. Right. I mean, Rick didn't have a motorcycle. And I mean, at the time, Hell's Angels Clubhouse was at the corner of Smith and, yeah. you know, just down the road from where I they think it still is. Yeah. yeah, it was very close. The, the Hell's Angels yeah, was. The building's still there, but the Hell's Angels aren't there anymore. Police records show a convicted serial killer by the name of Edward Edwards was also identified as a possible suspect. He was born in Akron. I know he had confessed to killing some other couples in the past, kind of similar M.O. What do you guys think about that one? Well, the, the big thing about Ed Edwards is he was, um, he confessed to killing two people in Norton. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of similar to, they were, the victims were kind of similar in age to Mary, Ricky and Mary. However, we talked to Ed Edwards. And the big thing that stood out to me when we talked to him was he goes, look, I'm, and he also confessed to another murder, I, th I believe in Streetsboro mm -hmm. at the time of killing a teenager. So Ed had always, Ed told us that, look, I've already confessed to these. I know this family. And he was, and I believed him. I, I believe, you know, I really believe him. He said, he's, look, I've confessed to these. If there's any closure I can give them that I was involved in this, I would. Like he had nothing to lose at that point. Correct. The detectives told me Edwards also had an alibi they were able to place him in Florida at the time of Ricky and Mary's murders. So you guys personally interviewed him? Wow. And, um, you know, he said, look, and I, I believe he was sincere. He says, look, I've already helped out these families, and I would, I would definitely want to, want to give their families closure, but I, that wasn't me. And it was the late Officer Swain who really dug into this last suspect. It was the man who owned the farm near where the teens' bodies were discovered. In fact, their bodies were found roughly 30 feet away from his driveway. Unfortunately, this suspect died in 1994, but that didn't stop Swain from looking into him. He put a lot of effort into this, and he was the one that uh, really was interested in following up on the homeowner or the landowner part of it, which had never really been explored before. And he's the one that he's the one that contacted and got the medical, the uh, veteran records from him. He's the one that sent some of the soil samples off to the FBI and he's the one that interviewed the, the, the person's brother. I mean, he did a lot of work. According to the suspect's military psychological report, he was diagnosed with PTSD and also had a history of alcoholism and violence. He also had a record of domestic violence. I read that he supposedly confessed to the murders at a point. Yeah, we've, we, that's never been confirmed. Um, unfortunately, uh, that was one of the things that never followed up on. Nobody ever interviewed him. And he, even though his name came up in the case, because everybody thought, you know, because he was, he had these mental issues, he was, he was a drunk, that nobody really gave him any credit or any time, and he was never interviewed as part of the initial investigation. I mean, that's kind of strange. Surely today you would have interviewed him. Right, yeah, looking back on it, you know, we could, we don't know why, you know, we can't, 
go back and put ourselves in their shoes why they didn't did do or didn't do anything but certainly if somebody said it even if you know it might be off base and they might have mental issues we'd probably definitely still you know look into at least talking to them officer swain never got the chance to interview the suspect but he did interview his brother who said it was quote possible that his brother could have committed the murders even telling officers that at one point his brother confessed to the crimes but claims it wasn't taken seriously I am not naming him since he was never charged with the crime, but his nephew did agree to talk with us. It, it's, yes, very troubling and unfortunate. Um, and it's unsettling, it's, you know, upsetting. The detectives have been here multiple times and spoken with both uh, my father and myself. And, uh, you know, we just hope that the issue would be resolved for the families that are involved. That would be a uh, blessing. He tells me he didn't know that his uncle was a suspect until I told him. Are you surprised to hear that? I don't know how well you knew your uncle or how young you were when he passed, but what do you think? Mm, okay, um, I know he was a veteran. Um, I didn't really know him very well. Um, the um, Just like multiple uncles of mine, he was uh, had seen action. So um, if that's any indicator, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm sure people that have post-traumatic stress, stuff of that nature, they could be more likely to be considered because of those things. But um, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I was too young probably. But um, I, I wish that there could be some kind of answer, for, like I said, for the families involved. And I think it's a tragic, sad, um, unfortunate thing that, you know, you would want closure and to understand what happened. Um, so I, I hope that that's what comes out of all this. I hope that's what they get. I asked the victim's siblings what they thought about this suspect, the man who owned property next to where the teen's remains were found. So what do you all think? Do you think he could have been the killer? 99.9% .9 I think he is. I'm right there with you, Nancy. <laughs> from everything we've been told, from the first investigation to and the Matthews worked on it, the only thing is, if he was, if he was the one involved, was, who else was with him? Because somebody, he, he didn't do it himself. It was pretty himself. brutal, yeah. 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 That um, was the only questionable. Because there's two different weapons used, which is usually indicates at least two people. Right. They use right. two different kinds of weapons, a knife and a gun. Mm -hmm. This is in the fact that we don't believe they were ever with the car where it was found. I mean, somebody you know, had to have moved the car. I just, Jimmy and I talk about I, this I all say, the time, him, you know, but it has and there's somebody else too. Yeah. Jimmy, Even mean, the detectives see, admitted you know, that this man was probably you know, their strongest suspect. The I'm no detective, but like out of all the theories, that one kind of seems that. like maybe the most plausible. Yeah, yeah, I think you know, we all I agree with that. This all the time. Uh, I, you know, but I mean, it yeah, he was familiar with the area. I mean, for as many good things there are that might link him to this case, there's also some where you have to question. What the medical examiner saying. Well, it wouldn't make sense for this to happen, but... As far as like what we know, it's probably I mean, yeah, he was you know, the most part. Area. My opinion is probably the I mean, most part. For as many good things there are that might link him to this case, there's also some we have to question. Uh, well, it wouldn't make sense for this to happen, but uh, as far as like what we know, it's probably you know the most part. My opinion is probably the most part. Out of the three, I don't disagree. Akron detectives tell me that this is one of the largest cold case files in their archives. And I saw it, I dug through it. There were hundreds of pages, dozens of boxes sacked up high. But despite all the documents and photos, there was just never enough physical evidence to nail down a definite suspect. Part of it's because of the time frame. Uh, we didn't have DNA, we don't, we don't have the uh, uh, technology part of it like we do now with cell phones and things like that. There just isn't, even if you brought it back up, there's nothing to test. We checked DNA, we checked fingerprints. There was um, even soil samples taken that were sent off to the FBI. Um, we've pretty much exhausted all the physical evidence. I mean, is there anything anyone at home watching could do if they remember anything that maybe you guys, someone you guys out there you haven't interviewed yet or? Well, I mean, these cases are always open. This the, this family's been looking for closure for a long time now, and we're always under the hope that if somebody does know something, that they'll give us a call. Um, as time goes on, you know, that chance gets slimmer and slimmer with people passing on. And um, but, I mean, there's still that possibility that somebody out there knows exactly what happened, and and for whatever reason, come forward to us. So it's still an open case. It fills up. 
you know, like I said, volumes of uh, case file room in our in our uh, storage area. So it's always there, and I would just, I mean, I would just hope for the family's sake, for as many hours, many years as they waited, that somebody would come forward if they do have information. Yeah, somebody's gonna have to tell, confess to it, um, or at least say, you know, I was there with somebody that did it. Um, I don't think there's any physical evidence that's gonna tie this one or solve this one now. It's gonna be, it's gonna be somebody confessing to it. And even after all these years, the siblings tell me it would give them some peace if they could find out what really happened to Mary and Ricky that night. Whatever you can give us, <clears throat> give the police department, no matter how minute it is, if it's something they don't have never heard about, please. I mean, it would be nice for us to go to our graves knowing that this has been solved. I just can't believe that 44 years later, we still don't know anything. I mean, fortunately, we do have, we know where she's at now. She's with our mom and dad and the rest of the Leonard and Gasparro family. But I wish I would know why Mary and Ricky were taken from us. It just doesn't make any sense. None whatsoever. If you're listening and you know anything about the unsolved murders of Mary Leonard and Ricky Beard, call the Akron Police Department's Detective Bureau at 330-375-2490. I'm Kelly Kennedy. Thanks for listening to Dark Side of the Land. Subscribe now for future episodes and find more Dark Side of the Land and photo galleries related to these cases at cleveland19.com.